A new financial crisis has developed recently in America, and the trail of destruction it could leave behind will look nothing like what you might expect. In fact, I believe nearly 40% of the elite publicly traded companies, brands you've known and used your whole life, could go bankrupt because of a strange market event I call a flipping, wiping out thousands of investors' fortunes. I just finished writing a brand new report explaining exactly what the flipping is and how billionaires are already profiting from this big event and what you should be doing to prepare as well. To get a copy of my new free report with all the details, simply go to mccallfreereport.com. Again, that's mccallfreereport.com for a free copy of my new report. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's August 11th, 2022. We got a big show coming up today. We have an interview with Mark Yusko. He's a CEO and Chief Investment Officer of Morgan Creek. He's also the Managing Partner of Morgan Creek Digital. So he's going to talk about stocks, the economy, the recession, Bitcoin. He's going to name his number one investment on the island for 10 years. You may not be surprised by it, but if you're out there holding it, you're going to be very happy about this. So coming up right now, Mark and I, we're going to talk about everything from the markets. We are going to dive deep into Bitcoin, why he's so much behind it. We're even getting into childhood education and prisons. This interview goes off the rails, but so much great information. All that more coming up right now on Making Money. All right, folks, as I mentioned, here he is, Mark Yusko, sitting here with us today. What's amazing is our producer's sitting in Baltimore. Mark is sitting in one of my favorite places of all time, Chapel Hill. And I'm down south of the border, Nicaragua, right now. So the world is amazing, the innovation that we have. Yet, Mark, we have all this innovation, and we have this global growth slowdown going on right now. How do you see this playing out? Obviously, there's a lot of great stocks that have fallen 70, 80 yeah. percent. The major averages went into a bear market. So where are we sitting right now, Mark? Yeah, look, I think it's a really interesting time, Matt, for that, that exact point. I mean, you look around the world, growth, I mean, I hate to say it too strongly, but I, I am prone to hyperbole, but it's collapsing. You know, we've had back to back, you know, negative quarters in of GDP growth in the U.S. and it's like, oh, well, that's not a recession. I'm like, well, no, that, that's not the only definition of recession. It's historically, you know, 90 plus percent correlated. But yeah, there are four big indicators and, and some of those are still wobbling uh, above recession levels. And the NBER will determine six months from now whether we were in a recession or not. But in regards to whether we are or aren't, global growth is slowing, whether that's in Europe, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in emerging markets, you know, China's economy nearly ground to a standstill because of their zero, zero COVID policy. And I think all of that has to do with high school wrestling, right? So we were talking about sports right before we went on. And I was a wrestler in high school. I wasn't a great wrestler, but I, I, I liked it. And I had this great coach. And, you know, he had two things that I uh, always remember, and I quote him all the time. You know, you'd be out there and you say, hey, I can't breathe. He's like, if you can talk, you can breathe. So, <laughs> you know, get back to work. And uh, the second was where the head goes, the body follows. So you want somebody's body over here, push their head and their body will go there. And look, if, if growth slows, profits are going to slow. Uh, you know, profits, company profits are just a reflection of, of overall GDP growth uh, and leverage. So it's unlikely that this massive profits recovery that people keep talking about is going to happen. And we've seen evidence of that in some of the reports. And I think that, you know, led to the, the final capitulation of some of those stocks, like you mentioned, the Pelotons and, and the Zooms that went down so much. But it says, oh, but Mark, the last couple of weeks, the market's zooming. Okay. Yes. A um, couple things. One, there has never been a 4% up day in a bull market ever. Okay, so we had a 4% up day a couple weeks ago. Well, well, wait a minute, well, isn't that the definition of a bull market? No, definition of a bull market is a market that goes up most days, but goes down sharply on bad news or perceived bad news, okay? A bear market is a market that goes down most days, but goes up sharply on good news or perceived good news. So, you know, when a company comes in and says, well, we didn't lose as much as we thought we were going to lose. 
that's not good news. That's perceived good news. So I think that's part of it. And then the second part is summer, right? And this summer, everybody's gone. Nobody's working. I mean, you and I are working, but almost nobody's working. You look around my office, you did see one person walking by, but there's no one here. <laughs> and everybody's on vacation. And so if you look at volumes in the markets, they're anemic. That's the perfect time for a short squeeze. So we were in free fall through the middle of June. We got to a point where everybody was out on vacation and the bots can come in and, and ex, uh, engineer a short squeeze. And I think we've seen some of that because the data that I see relative to growth and earnings still pretty ugly. So that being said, do you believe um, this continues to correlate with this uh, current bear market? Do you think it continues? We hit new lows. Will there be a buying opportunity at some point in the next 12, 16 months or so? You know, again, here's the hard part of, of markets. And if markets were easy, then everybody would, would be managers and you know, I wouldn't have a job. Um, it, yep. in, it's simple in theory, right? Buy low, sell high, yada, yada, yada. But it's really hard. And one of the things about investing, and it's kind of a mantra that I stole from a guy, Arjun Devecha at uh, GMO, and it really more applies to developing markets, but, but it does apply to all markets, that you actually make the most money when things go from truly awful to merely bad. And that's kind of the law of small numbers, right? So when things have gone down a lot, you know, let's say you go down 80%, so now you got 20 cents on the dollar, and you go back to only down 70%, so 30 cents on the dollar, you've gone up 50%. So you make a lot of money. And so I think there's a little bit of that going on. It's possible that the cathartic deleveraging lows have happened. And I will say in, in the crypto markets, which we'll talk about later, that has happened. I think we've seen the lows and you know that was the cathartic kind of deleveraging of the entire crypto ecosystem. The problem for, for broader equity markets is the amount of leverage in the system, margin debt, is still the second highest in all of history. And so there's still a lot that could get unwound if we get a kind of you know, September, October tough period, like is normal. You know, the old adage, sell in May and go away and don't come back till Labor Day, actually, you know, started in the UK and had to do with horse racing or something like that. But basically, and, and look, the Europeans, although can't call British Europeans because they're, they're not, but, but the Europeans do August right. Everyone just leaves and nobody even pretends to work. Um, but post Labor Day in through October has always been a really tough period for markets because people are coming back to work. They're looking at the stuff going, ooh, yeah, those, those numbers don't look good. And, you know, the, the, the one thing that drives me crazy right now about earnings is you have this process. A year ago, a company tells us, we're going to make a dollar. Nine months ago, oh, we're going to make 75 cents. Six months ago, oh, we're going to make a quarter. Last week, oh, we're going to make 10 cents. And then they come in at 11 cents and everybody's happy. That's a positive earning surprise. I'm like, how is that a positive surprise? You told me you were going to make a dollar. Now you make 11 cents. That's not positive. And I say, that's like taking the, the high jump bar off the rack, right? Put it on the ground, step over it, and call yourself the world high jump champ. That is ridiculous. So I think that's kind of what's likely to happen. I, I, there could be another leg down. There could be a cathartic realization that growth is slowing, profits are going to be bad, and that, that things really are looking a little ugly when people come back to work in September. But that said, that doesn't have to happen, and it may have already happened. And if that's the case, then there probably is some window of opportunity to start accumulating you know, good companies at, at low price. Because there are some good companies selling at low prices. The problem for me as I look at the markets, there's still a whole bunch of really bad companies that are still around, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, 40% of, I think I have this right, 40% of the S&P 1500, right? So the top 1500 stocks. 
can't even service their existing debt. Forget paying it back. Wow. They could never pay it back, but they can't even cover the debt service. And in a rising rate environment, that's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. So I do think we need to let a few more of those companies go away. It was like, oh, you know that? Why? Why are you always rooting for recession? Like I'm not rooting for recession, but I don't fear recession because recession, like winter, is necessary. It's part of the cleansing, right? If we don't have winter, then we don't have good springs. We don't have good crops because you let all the bad stuff cloud the ground. So we need winter to come in and kill off all the weak stuff so the strong stuff can thrive. Same thing with businesses. So I really do think um, that's a long, long answer, Matt, to why I don't think in the traditional markets people should be backing up the truck. You know, if you do some work no, and you find a company I, I that's, that's doing well and selling it at a low price, fine. Yep. But the other, the second problem for me, Matt, is there's still yep. a bunch of companies selling at 20 times revenue. Forget mm -hmm. earnings, because they don't have earnings. You know, these are the cloud companies and some of the high tech companies. And yeah, but it says, oh, but they're down 80%. I'm like, yeah, they could go down another 80% and still be expensive. And I'm not saying that they won't do well, but to me, a database company is a database company is a database company and fine if it's in the cloud versus in the traditional server stack, but 20 times revenues, I don't get it. No, you, you make a lot of great points there, Mark. A couple I want to touch on. One is uh, companies not going out of business. You know, I look at 08, look at 2000, 2002. Um, it wiped out a lot of companies that shouldn't have been there. And, and that's part, you know, to me, that's part of the business cycle. You know, you go through these cycles and, and you get too many companies rushing into it and you wipe them out. I, I hate to be that kind of guy because people are actually losing real jobs. So I hate, I don't real want job. to see that happen, real but job. it's part of the business cycle. We haven't seen that yet. Another thing we haven't seen, we haven't seen that capitulation, in my opinion, whether you measure it by the VIX or just measure it by feeling, I, you know, the eye test. I haven't seen that happen yet. So that, you know, I, I just said last week, I, I still think there's a, probably a 50% chance that we could hit new lows in the S&P. I'm about, I'm, 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 I'm not determined yet. That being said, I just got off a call with our, our head researchers right now, and we talked about some stocks that we like that have been beaten down. And trying to come up with a scan with all of our teams to find some really good companies that I feel either at or very, or may have hit their bottoms already. Yeah. And, you know, these are three, five, 10 year outlooks from here. I don't know. And, and I can't pick the bottom. We, nobody can pick the bottom, but I know I see some value in some plays. And if I'm, and, and, and if say we have found the bottom of the market, you want to put yeah. a little bit in, but you made a great point. Don't back up the truck, put some of your money in here now, but yeah. wait, because we could have another leg down and give you another opportunity. So I, I think that was great. One thing I, I want to mention, you talk about recession, you know, if the NBER comes out and tells us six months ago, we had a recession, six months from now we had a recession, does that actually help us? I think meteorologists and economists are some of the easiest jobs because they tell you everything that's already happened. They tell you it's raining outside now. They tell you we had a recession uh, eight, look, uh, nine months ago. I the thunderclap here in, in the background, probably yeah. in the background noise. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can look outside and, and, and see that it's raining. I don't, I don't need a meteorologist to tell me. But you're exactly right, and here's the crazy thing. The Fed, right, has this group of PhDs, all these people to predict the future, right? GDP. They're over. Like 268 yeah. times they've tried to predict GDP, and I don't know it was 268 or 272, I don't remember the exact number. But they're over. Like, I could flip a coin and be close to 50%. <laughs> But they're over. I mean, you have to work really hard to be over. So yeah, economists are the like what, what's one profession that makes you know actuaries look lively or something like that. I mean, it's <laughs> it's just I don't know. It's a dismal science for a reason. Um, you know, the one thing that you said that I think is is really important, and and we see it in the other side of our business. So we have our traditional asset management business, but then we have this digital venture capital business, and the thing that's interesting about recessions, and again, I don't cheer for them, but I believe they are necessary. And what I do like about them is, yes, I feel for every family that's impacted by you know, a worker being displaced. Feel for it. But here's the amazing thing. Some of the best companies in the future 
are created in those times of strife because it turns out if, if you get fired or if you lose your unemployment benefits, you find a way. And some people start new businesses. One of my favorite, favorite stories I tell this all the time. Um, back after the 90s recession, the deep recession, uh, there's this guy who's working at Bell Labs. And he's like, he got laid off. I think he was in Baltimore. And he, um, or Philadelphia, it doesn't matter. I think it was Philadelphia, actually. And uh, long story short, he said, can I take my project? And they're like, yeah, dude, we don't know what dense wave multiplexing is. So yeah, be gone <laughs> and take your project. And he went and asked all the venture capitalists, you know, to back him. And they're like, you shine light in a prism and it break it into colors. I, I don't get it. Well, it turns out every color holds the same amount of data as white light. So you increase the capacity of fiber optic cables. Very valuable. Very valuable. Long story short, no one would invest with him. He got his retired grade school teacher. Now, she did put all her eggs in one basket. She backed up the truck. She gave him all her life savings. Not smart. Great outcome. Turned her 300K <laughs> yeah. into 300 million. That company became Sienna, wow. which is an amazing business. Wow. And I love that story because from the depths of I'm fired, what am I going to do? I got to feed my family. He started business. And there are lots of those examples. I mean, JetBlue Airlines started at the bottom of the tech wreck in 2001. You know, um, not Shopify, but uh, uh, oh shit, another tech company that, that does data analysis, again, right at the bottom of, of 2001. And so necessity is the mother of invention. And if you need to earn a living, in many cases, people will find a way. Or go back and get training and and look, do I think we have the right systems in place as that safety net? No, I'm more about teach people to fish, not don't give them fish, right? Help mm -hmm. re-educate, retrain. And uh, I'll never forget. So I remember when a certain political candidate who might his house might have got raided this morning was down here in North Carolina when he was campaigning. And there was this video of him in this woman's face saying, I'm going to get your job back because she worked at a textile mill and her job had gone to China. And I'm like, no, you're not. Never. Not ever. And I'm not saying that she doesn't need a job. She does. But that job, manufacturing textiles, is never coming back. No matter what you do, it's never coming back. So get her in a community college, get her retrained, teach her computer programming, you know, teach her, you know, physical therapy, whatever. But that job never coming back. And to attack that issue with tariffs on Chinese goods to try to bring those jobs back was idiotic, right? It was as dumb as Smoot and Hawley mm -hmm. in 1930, which turned the recession into the depression. Yeah. No, that's, those are all great points. And, and I'm, you know, I'm glad we're driving here because I think we're, we're, we're pushing for the same and, and just kind of realizing that, you know, it's not an easy road to get there, right? It's not like it's all, you know, this uphill, you know, there's going to be some setbacks along the way, which, you know, it's, it's life, really. So speaking well, of some setbacks. You know, okay. and unfortunately, we've got a, a system of, of, of government now, politics, that's totally broken, right? And, and this is not a partisan statement. It's, it's both sides, all sides. In fact, I argue all the time. There's no left and right. There's no Democrats and Republicans. There's in- and out. And when you're out, you do or say whatever it takes to get in, including changing parties and whatever it is. And when you're in, you do or say whatever it takes to stay in. And because of that, we got the greatest polarization in history and therefore the least amount of stuff getting done. And that's bad. That's bad for progress. It's bad for, and it's because lack of leadership, you know, we've got, I hate to say it because I'm a boomer, right? I'm you know, second to last year of the boomers. But our generation, all the octogenarians are in charge, and that's not the way it needs to be. What we need is young, vibrant. Watch, watch speeches of John F. Kennedy. You want to talk about leaders. Watch speeches. And Ronnie was actually really pretty amazing because he was a little older uh, when he was making those speeches, but, but he wasn't in his 30s. But actually watch a speech of our current guy when he was 35 saying, pass the torch, pass the torch. I'm like, okay, now you got the torch. How about passing it? So let's get this younger generation 
with vibrance and enthusiasm and, and get some, some real leadership uh, up in DC. The problem though, Mark, is, is like you just, you just said, they're in. So they'll do anything to stay in. And that means keeping the young, vibrant, potential candidates out because out? that's unseat their job. Yeah, and that's the Absolutely. thing. You know, it's a, no, look. Yeah, I, I, and, and, yeah, and, we can fix it all with term limits, but that, that, that's too easy a solution. Yeah, that's too, I mean, that, that sounds, you know, it's too common sense for them to do that. Plus, <laughs> it's the inmates running the asylum, right? Why, why would they want to yeah. put them, so, I mean, it well, makes no sense. It's, but. Matt, it's like an entitlement, right? I mean, part of our problem with the U.S. right now is, is excess entitlements. Well, what is an entitlement? An entitlement is a promise you make to yourself that you don't fund and you ask your kids to pay for. Who would not vote for that? Right. Every old person would vote for more entitlements. So, you know, disregard the fact that when Social Security was set up, the retirement age was 65 and life expectancy was 58. Pretty good plan. Most people didn't make it. And there were 17 workers for every retiree. Pretty good plan. When I reach retirement age, didn't notice I didn't say retirement because I won't be able to. There will only be two workers for every retiree, which means I, I used to have two kids. I have two older kids. And I used to joke, that means I lose because ask the kids they're going to give to their mom, not me. So I had to have another kid. So we have a younger one that, and I still got to have one more, but that's not going to happen. So maybe I have to adopt one, but uh, at least my, my, my little guy will, will fund me. And all we got to do is change the retirement age because people are living longer. They're working longer. That's easy. Um, there are a lot of things that we could do, but once it's an entitlement, you're not allowed to change it. I'm like, well, why? The world changes. We should change everything. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So kind of a hard switch here, but I want to talk to you about crypto, Bitcoin. Obviously, yep. you're one of the guys I follow on social media a lot. Um, I know your view, but, you know, why don't you share the view with this current kind of crypto winter if it's over? I think you kind of alluded to a little bit earlier that you think it might we might have hit a bottom and kind of where we stand now and, and looking to the future with crypto, Bitcoin, maybe start with Bitcoin and go from there. Yeah. So So first and foremost... I, f I believe this really strongly, in fact, so strongly that I have totally pivoted. And you might have noticed I am not a 30 something black t shirt wearing crypto kid, right? I, I have white hair. Yep. I, you know, <laughs> I don't look like all the other people doing crypto. And now sometimes people look at me like, really? You, you, you do crypto? I'm like, yeah, why? Because all it is is technology. All we're talking about is an evolution of computing power, which started in 1954. It's a little company called DEC, Digital Equipment Corp., which was started with 75 grand of venture capital, grew into a multi-billion dollar business, and they brought computing from government to big business. 14 years later, there's an innovation around the microchip out in Silicon Valley. The nexus of the world shifted from Boston, Massachusetts, where DEC was, to Silicon Valley. And companies like Fairchild and Intel, you might have heard of it, were started. And then 14 years later, where I grew up in Seattle, this little company called Microsoft was founded. Many of my friends don't work. I was too dumb to go work at Microsoft. I always defend <laughs> myself saying, look at the picture of the original Microsoft 11, and you wouldn't blame me. <laughs> now, they're all billionaires, Sorry. and I'm not, so I shouldn't make fun of them. But just look at that picture tonight. It's hilarious. I mean, we all look bad in the 70s. They looked more bad. Um, <laughs> not that I was anything great, but but I didn't look like that. So, but there again, they're wildly successful. So 14 years later, there's this innovation called the internet. And I was at Notre Dame and, you know, fighting Irish on the wall behind me. And we put 500K in this little company with a stupid name called Google and took out 200 million. There should be a quad at Notre Dame called the Google Quad. 14 years later, there's an innovation around mobile telephony, the mobile net. And now, you know, everyone has a mobile phone. In fact, I was back in Seattle at Craig McCaw's house, an early pioneer in mobile, and I asked his family office guy, you know, I think the mobile net is going to be as big as the internet. It's like, Mark, are you kidding me? Ask me if they want a computer, like whatever. Ask them if they want a phone. They're like, I already have two. I probably don't need another one. Yeah, the mobile net's going to be a big deal. Well, now we have the truth net. What's the truth net? The truth net is blockchain technology. All blockchain technology is. All it is, is a ledger that instead of being private and owned by centralized companies like Microsoft or Amazon or whoever, and existing in CPUs in a server in the cloud, 
now can be open, public, owned by no one, right? So it's a permanent source of truth and it displaces the need for private databases. So it's just a database that's cryptographically secure and that was the innovation. And so blockchain technology's use cases, one is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a blockchain. It is a perfect store of value. It's basically digital gold. Gold, the only money in the history of the world. Everybody says, no, no, I got money all the time. I got dollars, I got yen. No, those aren't money, those are currencies. JP Morgan said it best. Gold is money. Money is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. Everything else is just credit, which means it's backed by debt. So every currency in the world is backed by government debt, not by gold and silver and, and precious metals. So gold has been this great store of value. And for 5,000 years, a single ounce has bought a fine person's suit. Not that anyone wears suits anymore, but if you wore, you know, suit in Cleopatra's time to a suit of armor, to a zoot suit, to Savile Row, go to Savile Row, one ounce, 15, 1600 bucks, you get a fine suit, man or woman's. And so Bitcoin is as good as gold, meaning it's equally scarce, which is what makes gold valuable, it's scarcity. And yet it's more divisible and more portable, right? If I had a bar of gold and I wanted to break it in half and give you half, really hard to do. If I want to send you half a Bitcoin, instantaneous. If I want to take that bar of gold and stuff it into the TCP IP internet protocol we're using right now, doesn't work. But I can use that protocol to send you Bitcoin instantaneously. And because it's a open public ledger that's cryptographically secure, I can know as soon as I transfer that value to you, And this can be anything of value. It can be a Bitcoin, it could be a car, it could be a house, it could be a stock certificate. Anything of value can become a token in a ledger, in a blockchain, and be secure. And, and the reason I call it the truth net is in the old days, to transfer value, we needed trust. And blockchain replaces trust with truth. Because here's the thing, I lend you money in the olden days. And I write down in my ledger, Matt owes me a hundred bucks. You come back with 110 bucks, pay me. And I'm like, oh no, Matt, it says right here, you owe me 200. You're like, no, I, I only borrowed a hundred. Too bad, I have the record <laughs> and you lose. So the yeah. Medici's, the benevolent Medici's came along 800 years ago and said, you know, Matt, you keep a ledger. Mark, you keep a ledger. And in their days they used actually things called tally sticks where you actually had a stick and you had a little carving. And we, the benevolent Medici's, for a small fee, will determine which is right. So Mark wrote down 200, Matt wrote down 100, but we wrote down 100, so we established trust. So for 800 years, we've had this banking cabal that has been the trusted third party. So any value exchange had to go through this banking cabal owned by the Rothschilds and the Medici's and the Morgans and the Rockefellers, et cetera. And so those guys got fabulously rich and the rest of us had a good life. Fractional reserve banking has, has actually made the world a better place. But what it also did is led to a concentration of wealth, the likes of which we've never seen. We have the highest wealth and income inequality in the history of mankind. And that's because it channels everything up to the top, mostly through the Fed. The Fed can create money out of thin air. Well, if you do that, what happens to the value of it? Well, think about it. When I was growing up in Seattle, right? I asked people all the time, what's the lowest price you remember for a gallon of gas? Mine's 31 cents. Totem Lake, right? 31 cents, gallon of gas. Was out in California visiting my son. I paid $4.31 for a gallon of gas. It's the same gallon of gas. It does the exact same thing. It produces the same amount of heat in the car. It's actually a little less because it's got ethanol in it now. Why am I paying $4.31? Well, it's not because the gas got better, it's because the money got worse. And think about it, if I have a trillion dollars sitting on the table in front of me, and you, the Fed, print another trillion, what happened to the value of that money? It just got cut in half. And here's a stat people don't believe. In the last two years, the Fed created half of all the dollars. Anyone remember why we, why we call it the dollar? Because we stole it from the Rothschilds in, in the Netherlands, called the dollar. And so now we have the dollar. And in 248 years of the Republic, okay, half 
of all the dollars that have ever existed were created in the last two years. So the value of that dollar keeps going. Oh, Mark, no, the dollar's going up. DXY is strong. No, 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 no. DXY is up because the yen and the euro are crashing harder than the dollar. It's like the old <laughs> joke about you're in the forest with the friend and, you know, the bear comes out and the guy sits down and put on his tennis shoes. And says, what are you doing? You can't outrun a bear. I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. Yeah. So <laughs> that's where we are is the dollar is weakening, but it's not weakening as fast as the other major currencies. But if you look at it relative to Bitcoin over the last two years, Bitcoin is up 100 percent exactly what you'd expect if you increase the money supply by 50%. I mean, if you increase by 100%, so you decrease the value by 50%. Like, huh, that makes sense. Okay, but Bitcoin's down since November. Well, of course it is. Everything's down since November because we had these massive liquidations of over-leveraged speculation. And when you get a margin call, here's the tricky thing. You don't get to sell what you want to sell, right? Peloton... You bought it on margin. It went down 90%. You can't sell Peloton to make the margin call. You got to sell gold. You got to sell bonds. You got to sell Bitcoin. So the things that didn't go down then suddenly go down. So now everything's going down. Correlations go up, but that's a temporal thing. Now correlations are reversing again. Friday was a great example. Markets were down. Bitcoin's up. Bitcoin's up a lot since mid-June. That's when I will say was the bottom, 17.5 uh, candle that day. And we made a series of higher lows and higher highs. And, you know, I think crypto spring is here. Now, we're still a ways from crypto summer when we get another parabolic move up. But that'll come probably in six, nine months. Yeah, I'm just looking at the chart right now, you know, after that spike back up. For the last couple of weeks, we've really been cons consolidating a pretty narrow range, um, kind of flirting with the 24 and change and like yep. 22 and the bottom. Um, to me, you know, I, I got in this business over 20 years ago, ago reading charts. That's a nice little coil there. So if that breaks above that 24 and change, let's call it, that is going to be a big move, in my opinion. As no, Matt, it's such a great point. I was actually looking at the same chart this morning and I tweeted out in, six weeks ago something that, that made me very unpopular. So there are chart patterns. People say, oh, it's just voodoo. I'm like, no, it's a representation of human activity and it's real. And so there's a very famous chart pattern called a descending triangle. And it's really simple. So you have this base level of support and the price will fall and it'll bounce and it'll fall, but it'll bounce a little less and it'll fall and bounce a little less and it'll fall and bounce a little less. And eventually you have this descending triangle, right? And when you get to the, the very point, you get two choices. You can either break out and go back up or you can finally break through and it's, it's like super fast. And so I tweeted out on the Thursday before Father's Day, look, the longer it stays at this 30,000 level, the more likely we are to break down and hit 15, kind of like we did in crypto winter in 2018 in November. And sure enough, over the weekend, you know, we went all the way down and, and hit that. Now, we didn't hit 15. We hit 17.5. Um, so call me a liar. But from that point, now we've made the reversal, which is we've made this series of higher highs and higher lows. Well, now we're pumping up against this 24 level and we've got a, an inverted uh, ascending triangle the other way. And to your point, if we break out of the 24, there's a lot of upside uh, on the other side. Yeah, I mean, again, like I, I used to get always get you know put down. I used to, my first job at Charles Schwab as a broker. Like, what are you reading these charts for? You know, it's voodoo, and I and I kept trying to explain to him that's that's showing all buyers and sellers right there. There's so much information reading those it's charts. Data. It's it's absolutely mind blowing. We live in a world where everybody wants everybody's data, right? People pay huge yeah. amounts of money to know what I did this morning walking around my house. <laughs> like, really? I walk to the same four places. I brush my teeth. I go to the bathroom. I eat breakfast. I have a cup of coffee. I get to my car. Why do you care about that? Yeah. Well, I we don't know how fast or how long you were brushing your teeth. Whatever. Data is very valuable. So an accurate record of all buyers and sellers, how is that not extremely valuable? And they say a picture is worth a thousand words. It is, right? I can interpret that picture a lot faster than I can go through the data and see what all the bids and asks were and where they got filled. But I can see chart patterns and patterns do repeat. It's like cycles repeat. And you know, the one thing I am a little worried about, Matt, that, that you know, we, we, 
it's the one thing that just keep me up. I, I, and I sleep really well. People say, what keeps you up at night? Nothing. I sleep really, really well. I'm blessed. And, um, but the one thing that I do think about is there's a 90 year cycle in, in the world. And that 90 year cycle has been going on for millennia. And it's driven by, again, generations of humans. It's three generations, 30 years. And each generation, it's like this book, The Fourth Turning, talks about these. Each generation of people has a different look and feel. And there's a reason. It's, it's kind of like when, when you have an only child or two kids or three kids, people say, why, why aren't they more the same? How could they ever be the same? One has no siblings. One has one sibling. One has two siblings. They need to be very different. And so generations are different. And there's a really conservative generation. Then there's a really aggressive generation. Then there's a, cons then there's a you know, the hip, the conserv then there's the hippie generation. And it, and it just cycles repeat. But in that 90 year cycle, there's a depression. And there's a depression in 1840. There's a depression in 1930. And here we are in 2020 something, and depressions are caused by bad government policies. And bad government policies are usually inflicted by people who shouldn't be, back to what we were talking about before, old people who overstay their welcome in office, who aren't in touch with the changes in the environment. And, you know, you think about, you go back and look at the pictures of the, you know, politicians making decisions like Smoot and Hawley. They were fighting the last war. And it's, it's like the, the, the story of Singapore, right? Singapore is an isthmus and they built these big guns on the end of, of the isthmus and they pointed them out at sea because they were worried about the Japanese coming in. They thought they'd blow them out of the water. Well, the Japanese were not dummies. They saw the guns, pulled the ships over and hiked up over the mountains and came in the back way and conquered Singapore. So the guns were pointed the wrong way and you couldn't turn them around. So the same thing is true here is using tariffs in a world where it's not about made in China anymore. 20 years ago, all about made in China, right? My friend's mm -hmm. daughter came to him and said, Daddy, I thought you said Santa Claus makes the brings the presents. Well, he does, honey, why? <laughs> why do they all say made in China? Yeah, 20 years ago, it was about made in China. Today, it's about made for China. China is the largest consumer market in the world. 700 million middle class. Think about that. Bigger than the US and Europe put together. Population, yeah. that's their middle class. Then they got another, you know, super class and lower class, but 700 million middle class. And that is the greatest consumptive force this world has ever seen. So now it's not like Russia. Everyone's looking at Russia. Why isn't Russia, why, isn't the, why aren't the sanctions working against Russia? because Russians are selling stuff to China, like lots of it. And they're denominating it in their own currencies as opposed to the dollar. So US dollar hegemony is falling. So there's this natural progression that happens and it's policy decisions. And I, I fear that the policy leaders we have in place today are making the same mistakes. And so I do worry that this garden variety recession we're in, which is more like an 01 kind of shallow recession, no big deal, could turn into a 30s or 1840s style depression. I'm, again, I'm not wishing for that. I'm not predicting that. But I am saying if you continue down the path of over tightening, right, the Fed, bad decision, you're restricting liquidity at the, the government level, you know, passing bills to throttle innovation and wealth creation, right? Why would you do that? Why would you ever pass a bill that decreases the incentive to innovate and create income and wealth? Why would you want to tax that? It's, it's completely illogical, right? Why would you ever want to discourage people becoming wealthy? You should never want to, because those people create lots of jobs. That's where all the jobs come from. And so if we want to succeed societally, what we want to do is encourage innovation, encourage business formation, not discourage like this nonsense they just passed over the weekend. So I do worry that we're in a really bad place from a policy perspective, and that presents risks to investors, which I think are smart to listen to you and you know, be careful out there. 
You know, you make, you make a good point there. And, you know, to me, this goes back to politics. And again, I'm kind of apolitical. I, I, I'm frustrated with every, every politician right now, I'd say, you know, on both sides. And it's about staying in. I'm going to go back to what you said earlier, Mark. It's right. about staying in. So for them to stay in, you need to get the constituents hooked on something, hooked on entitlements, hooked on payments. The moment they go out and do it themselves, they don't need you anymore. That's what it is. And, and that, that, I mean, Amen. I can't believe we can't see through that sometimes. I mean, it, it just, it just blows my mind and it, it's frustrating. I'm getting frustrated now. I try not to let politics get in my well, skin no, no, anymore, And it's but, worse than that, Matt, man. because it's, it happens like this at the tail end of civilizations, right? And I don't mean to be too dramatic, yeah, but right. all yeah. empires fall. Yeah. Everyone, yeah. the Roman empire, the Ottoman empire, the British empire. Remember there was a time from 1860 to 1913 the sun never set on the British Empire. The most powerful superpower in the world was the little old UK. They had the most powerful navy. The, the um, pound sterling was the world reserve currency. We were a little emerging market run by gangs. Look at the movie Gangs in New York. Think what it was like to live here. And people forget that. And the UK, what'd they do? Well, they made a couple bad policy decisions. They invaded Mesopotamia. They incurred a bunch of debt. They fought a war they couldn't afford. It impoverished them. We ascended. The dollar took over as the world reserve currency. And the rest is history. Now, a little bit of nuclear power around the subs. But, that, but the bottom line is they made a bad policy decision. They overreached in their quest for resources, not realizing that the world had changed. Wars were fought in the old days to pilfer, right? To get resources that you had used up. We don't have to do that now. There's global trade. I mean, Adam Smith was right, right? Comparative advantage works, right? You make sweaters, I make food, we, sh we, sh we swap. I don't have to grow wool and you don't have to grow food. We can trade. And this whole movement away from globalization back to nationalism and populism and I hate them and I hate them <laughs> is so counterproductive. And it's, yes. but it goes to this problem of, of lifetime politicians are beholden. Full stop, yeah. right? If it costs a hundred million dollars yeah. to become a senator, which it does, not many people. Meg Whitman tried; she didn't win, but she spent 130 million of her own money, I guess. But most people don't have 100 million dollars. I don't have 100 million dollars. I don't know if you have 100 million dollars, but most people don't have 100 million dollars. Nope. But so, what do you do? Well, you get 100 million dollars from people. Well, what do they expect? Stuff like this crazy story, and this wasn't even 100 million dollars. This was 300 thousand dollars. This family gave to the governor of New York, and then she awarded them an emergency contract for $600 million of COVID tests. Are you kidding me? I mean, that's not how government works. There's a bid process, but exactly emergency powers. That is, that's how bad policy decisions happen. And it's why I believe we are where we are and why the risk of this garden variety recession morphing into worse is is real we have to think about it yeah that that story right there the, the about new york i mean that's that's just criminal that's not even unethical criminal. to me that is flat yeah. out criminal yeah all right so well, last week i had uh, what that goes to is what i call the dictator playbook right the dictator playbook has been going on for years and years and years is a dictator gets in and they put all their cronies at the top so they give all their friends all the top positions. They siphon all the assets up there through taxation or outright theft. And then they impoverish the masses by devaluing the currency. Printing a lot of money. Wait, 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 what? That's what we're doing. <laughs> well, the, then what do you do? Well, how do you get voted in? If you've impoverished people, how do you get voted back in? Freebies. Oh, that was that student debt. You don't have to pay that back. Oh, here's some money for inflation. Oh, here's some free money. Argentinians, Zimbabweans, Venezuelans. Is that really what we want to be? That's not my aspiration, but that's where we're going. This whole talk of UBI and forgiving. The thing, student loan debt. That is someone else's asset. Every liability has an asset owner. So if you forgive that liability, someone's losing an asset. Oh, well, it's just the government. There is no government. The government <laughs> is us, right? It's our money. Unless they print more. And if they print more, then they just yeah. make us less rich. So it's all messed up. But that's fun. I, I like how you just like mentioned government. Has no clothes, right? We need we need the kid. Yeah. We need the little kid yeah. to say, 
mom, they're naked. I mean, they're literally naked. We need to get them out, all of them. Like, start yeah. over. Well, I hope that happens. And last week I had Jim Rogers on, and he was calling for the worst bear market in his lifetime coming up. Uh, now we're talking the 90-year cycle. So I want to end on something positive, Mark, if that's okay. Yeah, let's do that. So I, I asked all my, all my guests before I leave, I said, if you're on an island, in a beautiful island with your family and whoever else you want there for the next 10 years, but you don't look at the internet, you don't look at the smart stocks or anything else, what is the one investment you feel very comfortable buying for in 10 years, not looking at it and looking at it when you get back 10 years from now? Oh, it's easy. Bitcoin. Um, okay. Easy. I mean, and, 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 it's, and, it's, and it's not even because Bitcoin's great. It's just because I believe that this process of devaluing currencies is going to continue. So I could say gold, and Jim probably said gold, but gold lacks things that Bitcoin doesn't, right? Gold is not portable. It's not divisible. It's heavy. It's hard to, you know, it's hard to hide, right? I mean, if I'm walking around with a sack of gold, you can kind of tell. If I'm walking around with a lot of Bitcoin <laughs> on my phone, you really can't tell. And so yeah. Bitcoin is digital gold. And so 10 years ago, actually 14 years ago, before 2009, I would have said gold because the only true store of value over a 10 year period is gold historically and now Bitcoin. Now, and, and because it's a desert island, I don't have the ability to influence the growth of some business. So if, 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 I, could, if I could pick a business that I knew was going to grow, that would be a better investment, right? You know, you think about Amazon or Facebook or, and I do think there are going to be the equivalents in the blockchain world in Web3 that, you know, a decentralized social media, that's going to be big. I mean, it's going to be huge. And I'd love to have that, but I, I don't know which one that is yet, whereas I'm pretty sure Bitcoin is the winner for digital gold. So uh, lots of things that I want to invest in, but if you limit me to one, that's the one, because I also don't have to look at it every day. I don't even yeah, have to look at it every because Because it is deflationary in its design, meaning there's 21 mm -hmm. million forever and always. No one can create more. With dollars... Anything I own in dollars, the government can devalue tomorrow at any sure. time for any reason. Yep. And that, it, it's like, well, people say, I used to be cash. In 10 years, cash could be worthless. I mean, literally it could be worthless. Maybe, maybe not worthless, but it could be worth, I mean, look, housing prices in North Carolina, up 40% in the last year. Oh, that's so great. No, it's not. My house didn't grow. It didn't get more efficient. It has nothing to do with my house. It means the dollar yeah. got less good. Yeah. And here's amazing stat. Stocks, even with the downturn, near all-time highs, right? In dollars. Priced in gold, unchanged since 1996. In Bitcoin, crushed, like, like down a lot. But I won't even use that because the, the first five years of Bitcoin price don't really count because it was like a science experiment. Last five, six, seven years, they count. But in gold, stocks are unchanged since 1996 because gold is money, dollars are not. Yep, that makes perfect sense. Um, and I, I, you know, I will tell you, Jim Rogers didn't pick gold, but he picked silver. So you were pretty darn close. Ah, for, for his. I, well, <laughs> and silver is just the... Uh, it, it's it's more undervalued today than gold because um, yeah. for lots of different reasons and it's and it's cheaper and so more people can own it so I can see lots of reasons why he would say that um, but both are good both yeah I will I will say I don't own any silver I don't own any gold I am very heavily allocated with my own personal money in Bitcoin so I'm rooting for you Mark and your ten years on that on that deserted beautiful island that you have. me too but thank you me so too. much for joining us hopefully we'll get you back on soon but uh, great discussion well, that was a lot so of much fun I, look I, I love talking to people who who do this for a living right who who actually ask questions questions are way more important than answers right the hardest thing in the world is what you're doing, right? Is to have guests on and ask questions because answers are easy, right? You can just make it up as you go along and you talk about stories and whatever. <laughs> questions are hard. And 
what we need in the world is people who, who know how to ask questions. I, I this great example. So I, I, my wife and I funded a, a scholarship program at Notre Dame, um, modeled after the program here at, at North Carolina called the um, Moorhead Canes. And we had this kid and we send them off to do a social service summer. So they have to go pick a big problem, hunger, women's rights, education, whatever. And they have to go someplace in the world and, 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 and you know, experience real pain, suffering, and try to make a difference. And, and this one kid, he has this great line. He says, you know, at some point, you got to ask the question, why does hunger even exist? Right? I, I get mad about this, Matt. We live in a country, blessed, blessed to live in this country. Best country in the world, right? Until they mess it up, best country in the world. And that's nothing against any other country, but it's, it's just a great place. Right. But we spent $20 billion on weight loss. Just let that number sink in. $20 billion to shed excess calories. Yet we have tens of millions of kids who go to bed hungry every night. That's bullshit. Wow. That, that is. We have plenty of calories. We have plenty of calories. We just don't have the system in place to get the calories to the right people. People shouldn't need to shed thousands of dollars of, of money to shed thousands of calories. Don't put them in your mouth. Give them to somebody who needs them. And I said, I get really, I don't mean to end on a bad note, but that's something that we can solve all these problems. We just have to work together. And we have a line incentives that, you know, ask the right questions. So questions rule. Questions rule. Well, hopefully we can get our politicians to work together at some point to figure out some of these problems that seem logical to you and I, Mark, and seem very easy to fix. Uh, but unfortunately, they have different uh, motives than we do. So hopefully at some point we can get well, one this. Of, one of the quick ones that, that I always love, this is one of my favorite stories. So I, when I came to North Carolina, one of the things they do when you work for the university, that's where I started, uh, they send all the newbies on a tour for a week. You go to all the different places in North Carolina to learn about North Carolina. So two really cool things. One, go to a tobacco farm. And you know, everybody says, well, why don't you just grow something else? Why do you grow this bad thing, tobacco? He says, well, let me tell you a couple of things. If I grow an acre of tobacco, I get paid 5,000 bucks. If I grow an acre of soybeans, I make 200. What would you do? <laughs> like, no, that's not, not true. It, it, 5,000 to 200? Well, yeah, I'd, I'd grow tobacco. So that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but the one that was so enlightening and the one that, again, it's been my personal crusade now. Uh, we have a little foundation that we start with Morgan Creek and all of it goes to early childhood education because we went to this youth prison and the warden, uh, we're over lunch, says, there's a woman and she says, you know, what do you think is the number one determinant of whether you go to prison? And, you know, we're all like, oh, I don't know, single parent household, poverty, drugs, and like, nope, 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 nope. And she let us go for like 10 minutes. Nope, nope, nope. She says, all right, you want to know? I'm like, yeah. She says, score on the second grade reading test. It's like, what? She says, yeah. If you score below a certain level on the second grade reading test, you will fall behind. You will be ostracized. You will drop out. You go to prison. We build prisons in this country based on the scores regionally on the second grade reading test. I'm like, that is solvable. It's called Head Start. We can fix that. So what's the first thing we cut in all the government budgets? Head start. So anyone who wants to help the world donate to early childhood education and we could solve together one of the big problems, which is, you know, too many people in prison. Well, we can end on that because that is a good note. I, I love that, you know, letting people know where they could put their hard-earned money and to help it make this country even better. So we're going to end on that because I really do love that. And I want to commend you for sharing that and for putting your time and effort and your money into that as well. I think that's fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. No, look, I appreciate, I appreciate again, the, the opportunity to have these conversations. And I, again, love the fact that you and I can talk about anything. No one thought yeah. we were going to talk about early childhood education in prison, I bet. But that's 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 a good interview, and I'm glad you're on, and we're going to have you on again soon. But thank you so much, Mark, and we'll we'll have you back soon. All right, thanks, Matt.
Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.